Now, as I said earlier, we have not got the time to deal with all the sundry historical machinations from the last 11,000 years. But one particular <coughs> period, one particular epoch that uh, should concern us is what we know today historically as the Renaissance. About the time of the 15th century, as they were congratulating themselves on their progress, the alien bureaucracy discovered the presence of the Stargate. They had to face the fact that even if all their technological hardware was successfully reconstructed, they still could not vacate the planet Earth, which had been placed under quarantine. So here we have it. Hundreds, thousands of years are going by. The alien progeny have understood that, yes, all the technological hardware that they once had created and had brought here to the planet Earth, which may have even included spacecrafts and all sorts of cybernetic, uh, technologically advanced devices, all of it, or a good deal of it, has been destroyed. So here they are, spending 11,000 years moving mankind gradually, manipulating every phase of history, putting whole nations under the swords, stretching their empire out to encompass the whole of the globe, mining and enslaving the whole human race in order to slowly, incrementally push the technology further to the point where they can restore some of this. And that accounts for why in the world, for 11,000 years, we've been so sexually and uh, ge genetically and uh, genderally and, and emotionally and psychologically arrested while we're so super technologically advanced. But they've realized, after they discover the Stargate, that now, even if they manage to succeed in phase one. The Stargate exists. They're in quarantine. Perhaps they'll never be able to leave after all. And they probably found this out the hard way. A very huge and puzzling meteorite fell thunderously in Soviet Siberia on July 30th, 1908. Peasants heard the awesome explosion as far as 620 miles away. A large area of forest was flattened as if an immense object had fallen. No remnants of the alleged meteorite could be found anywhere underground. Radioactivity had initially been released in enormous amounts. The general destruction showed that the energy released had been far greater than the mere impact of a falling stone, no matter how huge. Most significantly, the aerial path of the falling object had not been uniform, but had amazingly changed during descent. Various Soviet scientists then put forward an amazing theory that it had been a spaceship driven by intelligent beings and loaded with a great power from a nuclear power plant which had exploded through some accident. Well, if you go along with the theories we're advancing here, we can edit this statement slightly. From the Renaissance and probably before, through this process of pushing mankind forward, the alien progeny of Atlantis, their descendants, of course, probably were able to build some rudimentary spacecrafts and it was through taking these up into the ionosphere that they discovered the presence of the Stargate. And perhaps crashing right into it, these spaceships would then fall back to Earth in the way just described here. So it's not that we should understand this as spaceships coming into our solar system and then entering into our Earth atmosphere and then mysteriously veering and careering out of control and crashing into the Russian uh, forests. It uh, can hardly be said that um, those who've got the ability to cross hyperspace would then enter into our planetary space and lose control of their spacecrafts. If something doesn't sit quite right with that story, more likely, Earth ships are making uh, journeys into the ionosphere in, a, in order to penetrate the barrier and can't do so, and then perhaps they lose control and fall back to Earth. But undaunted by this discovery, the alien progeny decide to press ahead. They put their greatest intellectuals onto the problem to see if a solution could be found, believing that what technology could erect, technology could take down. The major dynasties of the planet underwrote occultists, scholars, scientists, and philosophers to work on the Stargate problem. Elaborate efforts were also made to cover up the existence of the real opus. The perfect covers came to be that of both science and occultism. It was so effective that even today, most students and practitioners of both science and magic are unaware of the practical importance of their work and to whom it is really of benefit. Those of the inner sanctums also adopt clever cover acts and stories in order to be able to work undetected. Fronts are utilized by all major criminal syndicates, and it is no different with the children of the Nephilim, who have a great deal to hide 
from public view. And at this point, we should remark that, of course, when we talk about the Atlantean progeny, we're not talking about the originals, these beings from other worlds with a pure alien DNA, and perhaps even some of their progeny, those with human and alien DNA, live for extended periods of time. There's reports that the original alien warlocks could live for up to 700 years, but they are not eternal and do, in fact, die. So the Atlantean progeny, the bloodline that we're talking about, are descendants of the original warlocks of Atlantis. Uh, we can surmise that none of the original warlocks exist, although some accounts say that they do. So who are the new Atlanteans? And how would we identify them? Well, we've got strange personalities all over history. Open any history book and faces stare out of you. Machiavelli, Nostradamus, all these bizarre creatures and characters and the dramatis personae of history. Interestingly, here we have a picture of Rasputin, the Russian warlock. Well, the word Grigori, Grigori means in Greek the fallen one or the fallen angel. And of course, Rasputin was the devil responsible for the destruction of the Romanov dynasty in Russia. But we can speculate that uh, the great kings have the alien blood and perhaps even some of the popes. And it's not so far-fetched when you start reading some of their biographies and pensions for slaughter and abuse. We have in uh, English mythology, William the Conqueror, of course, the Norman king who brought such destruction and mayhem to England. In fact, uh, so bad it was that the people of England referred to his reign as doomsday. This is the term that the Saxon English used for the seizure of their land and the subsequent taxation, which was hitherto relatively unknown. William the Conqueror brought the pyramidical organizational structure to feudal England. But just before he died, and I mean a matter of days before William died, he had this to say, I have persecuted its native inhabitants beyond all reason. Whether gentle or simple, I have cruelly oppressed them. Many I unjustly disinherited. Innumerable multitudes, especially in the country of York, perished through me by famine or the sword. Having therefore made my way to the throne of that kingdom by so many crimes, I dare not leave it to anyone but God alone, lest after my death worse should happen by my means. And of course, no Irish person on the planet can forget the scorched earth policy of Oliver Cromwell, who literally murdered thousands of Irish people in an all-out blitzkrieg. The 14th century Plantagenet King Richard II, one of the most unpredictable of English kings, after the unsuccessful Peasants' Revolt, he declared this to his Saxon underlings, and these are his own words. God omnipotent is mustering in his clouds on our behalf. Armies of pestilence, and they shall strike your children yet unborn and unbegot, that lift your vassal hands against my head and threat the glory of my precious crown. You wretches, detestable on land or sea, you will seek equality with lords and are unworthy to live. Give this message to your colleagues. Rustics you were, and rustics you are still. You will remain in bondage, not as before, but incomparably harsher. For as long as we live, we will strive to suppress you, and your misery will be an example for posterity. However, we will spare your lives if you remain faithful. Choose now which course you want to follow. This is the refrain of the kings of all of the world. This is the kings, the potentates, the nobles, and the lords. You only have to listen to what they have to say. Now, the most powerful dynasty that enjoyed direct descent from the Atlantean bloodkin was the Tudor dynasty of England. The word Tudor comes from the word tutor, meaning the teachers, that is, the educated ones, those with knowledge. The leader of the Tudor dynasty during this period was called the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth Tudor, Elizabeth I. Literally, she who must be obeyed. Here we have that term, term virgin again also, which uh, one should note. The Virgin Queen. And the symbol of the Tudors was the famous rose, the, the Tudor rose. And this is uh, why, for instance, there is a rose garden near every... Um, government office or government uh, central headquarters 
And we have the War of the Roses, of course, in historical terms in England. The father of uh, Elizabeth I was the famous Henry VIII, Henry Tudor. Queen Elizabeth I was put in charge of the problem of the Stargate. And as such, she employed several different people. At the head of these individuals, she placed the man on the left who is known as Sir John Dee. And Sir John Dee's helper on this problem was Edward Kelly, the uh, Irish uh, clairvoyant. John Dee, Dr. John Dee, is the creator of Enochian magic. Note that word Enochian because Enoch, of course, is one of the prophets of the Old Testament. But the word Enoch also means the inner eye or the initiated ones. So Enochian magic is nothing more than the magic of the high ones, the magic of the initiated ones. And through Enochian magic, John Dee believed he could talk to the angels. Now, if we go to the actual book of Enoch, after which the word Enochian comes, the prophet Enoch had this to say in the very opening passage of his book. The words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and the godless are to be removed. And he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. So Enoch is prophesizing our times again, the days of tribulation. It turns out that this mysterious master astrologer and uh, court official and ambassador, Sir John Dee, was also the head of MI5, uh, the British Secret Service. It's the first secret service that ever existed. The first secret police existed in Tudor England and was created by John Dee. And when John Dee used to go on occasion to visit the royal houses of other countries, and when he'd write back to his mistress, she who must be obeyed, Elizabeth I, he'd always sign at the bottom of his documents, 007. That was the sigil of the head of MI5 of those days. Now, of course, that is later picked up in the stories of Ian Fleming, and the reason for that is because Ian Fleming himself was a member in more modern times of the British Secret Service. And what better upon retirement than to write about his own organization? So the 007, the original, way back at the time of the Tudor dynasty, was Sir John D, master occultist. And if you study the symbol for MI5, you'll notice that it has a triangular pyramidical shape with the crown of the queen. And it has a eye, the Enochian eye, at the northern apex. Now, John Dee was one of the most powerful black magicians in history. He decided that it would be better to contact pan-dimensional intelligences to solve their little problem of quarantine. Via his system of magic and divination, he succeeded in opening a portal to these fourth dimensional entities, or oversouls. D became a living macroscope. This was not the first time in history where such a forbidden rite was undertaken, and every time it does occur, it has the severest repercussions from history. So John D, being a master occultist and connected throughout the world, he looked into this problem and decided that, that there wasn't any normal technological or scientific way that they were going to be able to find this key, so to speak, to the Stargate. But he said he could use his occult power. So with Edward Kelly and all the other occultists of Europe, in combination, in concert, they decided to call on what are known in the occult world as pan-dimensional oversouls, beings that are above our level of consciousness. Not necessarily more pure or more spiritual, but of a higher spiritual intelligence, let's say. The oversouls. Later writers have called these entities the macrobes. This word comes from the fact that there are beings, creatures, entities below us who are called the microbes, and it takes a microscope to see them. Before the advent of the microscope, if anyone had told you that there's all sorts of little creatures and little entities, but you just can't see them, we would have thought they were crazy and probably burned them at the stake as being heretics. But as soon as we have the right instrument, we look through it, and we're able to see a whole world, a whole ecostructure 
of microbes and bacteria and viruses and whatnot? Well, above the level of the human consciousness are the macrobes. And as yet, there's no instrument per se in order to see it. But there is an instrument, and that instrument is known as the human intuition. It's through the human intuition, the human imagination, that one can make contact with the macrobes. John Dee did, did make contact with the macrobes. In fact, he became what might be described as a living macroscope. Now, in short, Dee was told that there were two cardinal premises which needed to be mastered before the Stargate could be opened. The first precept concerned creating matter from energy, but that would have to be revealed in two main stages. And the second concerned the properties of a certain element, and that element was silicon. Now, phase one concerned creating matter from energy, but as the macrobes instructed John Dee, the human race was way too primitive for that. That, that phase one would have to be taught to them in two stages. Part one would be to learn how to do the exact reverse, release energy from matter. And then after that, they would be taught how to create matter from energy. And phase one of that was accomplished on July 16th, 1945, at Alamogordo or the Trinity experiment when the atomic bomb was released. So the splitting of the atom was phase A of phase one being able to release energy from matter. Later on, after that period, from the period of 1945, we would start to see experiments which would work on the rest. So MIT, SRI, Hoover Institute, and so on. Um, these organizations are merely fronts for this experimentation, looking at how to now manipulate matter and create it from energy. Phase two was the silicon revolution the properties of silicon. And of course, we know that silicon is created or is a gateway to the computer age. Silicon makes computing possible. And we're told that technology makes life easier. These are the cover stories that let us buy into some of this stuff. If grandma can do her shopping on the internet and we could talk over the internet and buy our VCRs, most people are happy and don't think of any of the occult reasons behind the creations of these powerful instruments. Now, one of the greatest New Atlanteans, other than John Dee and Elizabeth I and the Tudors, was Sir Francis Bacon. A Knight Templar, a major occultist, Sir Francis Bacon was appointed Solicitor General and chief advisor to the British Crown on June 25th, 1607. He conceived the idea of reactivating various secret societies, and in 1580, he founded the secret Rosa Cross Literary Society and the Lodge of Free and Accepted Speculative Masons. Bacon is said to have been introduced to the 33rd degree system into masonry from the original Templar nine degrees. So Bacon introduced the 33rd degree system into Freemasonry. For one year, he had in his possession the first English translations of the Bible. In fact, he was the first major editor of what would become the King James Bible. He also added secret information into the Bible, which was not there before. Now, William T. Smedley, who is a biographer of Francis Bacon, said, it will eventually be proved that the whole structure of the authorized Bible was Francis Bacon's. He was an ardent student, not only of the Bible, but also of early manuscripts. So Francis Bacon was yet another one of the great thinkers and intelligences that was put onto the problem of the Stargate. He was directly working for the Tudor dynasty. In Talisman, by Graham Hancock and Robert Bival, they write, Bacon was a passionate exponent of Britain's colonialization and development of its recently acquired North American territory of Virginia. In 1606, the so-called Virginia Company, there's that word again, Virginia Company was granted a royal charter by James I, which allowed it virtually unlimited power of government in the colony. Bacon had been instrumental in the creation of the charter. Bearing this in mind, it is not surprising that in New Atlantis, Bacon refers to Ben Salem as the virgin of the world. That's right. Francis Bacon wrote two very important books that all scientists know. The first one was called The New Atlantis, 
and the other, the nouveau organum, the new organism. The new organism and the new Atlantis. Now, Sir John Dee worked closely with his confederates all over the globe. The information transmitted by the macrobes was done cryptically and was voluminous. He realized that many centuries would have to elapse before even the basics could be realized. He also knew how inefficient and counterproductive it was going to be to have, to separate geni to have separate genius types working in their private garrets all over the planet. The knowledge could not be collated efficiently in this way. So he and his masters devised a scheme to have the scholars come to one place to work and amass the knowledge. These places we know as the universities. And that's right. John Dee realized that it was going to be unproductive to have all these different scholars and occultists and eccentrics and whatnot working in all sorts of corners of the world. Better to bring them all into centralized locations. That's what the word college means. The word college means collage, uh, where many can come together. And of course, there's the silicon connection now fully understood. We've moved on even from the time of universities. Universities can collate. Yes, they can collate in libraries. You can have papers. You can have documents. But soon even that becomes so voluminous. Even that becomes open and privy. Now you can introduce hierarchies. You can introduce fraternity uh, structures into the university system so that, again, you police people and only the purest you know, can ascend through the ranks to find out what the real agenda is. But even that, in the end, can become a problem. The computer is the miniature university with unlimited data storage space. So here we have a tie-in from the silicon idea and the carbon life forms. Because the internet promises you also worldwide communication. It's a virtual library, an endless space for archival storage. Now another level of information that the macrobes had uh, transmitted to John Dee, and what he also realized from his interactions with these supernatural beings was that in order to even move along with this process, it was going to take hundreds of years. And in fact, from what he was receiving from them, he realized that they would have to subjugate the whole planet in order to not only continue to move the technology forward, but in order to get the element silicon and be able to process it, the whole of the planet would have to be subjugated. And therefore, it is from that time, it is from the time of the 15th and 16th and 17th century that we have all the idioms we associate with England, we have the rising of the great navies, we have the rising of empire, we have the rising of the first stock exchanges, and we have the rising of the colonial impulse. A tiny little nothing country, England, where a hundred or two hundred years before the kings were shivering in windowless castles, literally shivering, couldn't even get the taxes together to fight their neighbors. And suddenly we have empires beginning, empires starting, the great proliferation of what we now know to be the British Empire. And of course, in the vanguard of this were the beings that we know as the pirates or the pirates, because the word pirates actually means the men of fire. These were direct agents of the Tudor dynasty. The heads of the pirates were the top officials of the pirates. The leaders of most of the pirates were the top brass of the Tudor dynasty, trained in the finest universities, even the fine maritime universities. And one of the greatest leaders of them all was Sir Francis Drake, and of course, the word Drake actually means the dragon. San Francisco Bay was originally called Drake's Bay. The pirates, or the pirates, the men of fire, serving the Tudor dynasty, were headed by men like Sir Francis Drake and Edmund Spencer. He was the great-grandfather or the ancestor of Lady Diana Spencer. The progeny of the pirates settled on the lands that they conquered and opened the great universities for the education of their sons and daughters. They employed the fraternity structure to ensure that only the chosen would be exposed to the real occult history of the world and to their role as the future leaders and thinkers, overworld and underworld figures, educated and funded to adroitly lead the rest of mankind down whatever roads became necessary. In the tarot cards, for instance, the devil card is number 15. And we have the old uh, pirate motto, 15 men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, and a bottle of rum. But the occult history of the pirates has really never been told. And of course, the famous symbol of the pirates was the skull and crossbones, a symbol known to be used before them by the Knights of Malta and the Knights Templars or other occult fraternities. 
and the job of the pirates was to bring mayhem and disease and slaughter to all the lands that they colonized. These were agents of the British crown and not as the Errol Flynn movies of the swashbuckling buccaneers tries to show you some romantic heroes. These people were cutthroats and they were, had an agenda to be sent out to all the corners of the world and to massacre, massacre whoever they found there. It's important to bring out at this time that the macrobes don't work for free. Though John Dee was successful in contacting them and though the macrobes did transmit a great deal of information that he desired concerning the quarantine and Stargate problem, they don't work for nothing. And John Dee was soon to find out what it was that they wanted in exchange for, his ser for their services. What they wanted has had the severest consequences for the future of mankind. The macrobes basically told him that what they wanted was blood. Blood has some very specific occult properties, and that's what the macrobes wanted. And John Dee, his reply was, how much do you want, and when do you want it? Whatever it takes. This thing is already going to take us hundreds of years. Whatever you need for that information, you will get it. And so John Dee literally put the whole of the human race up in a great black magic mass, a great right to his overlords, the oversouls that were asking him for payment, literally, in blood. Now, blood happens to be the second commonest word in the Bible after God. And Eric Fromm, the scholar, the German scholar, says, at a deep archaic level, blood is very peculiar substance. Quite generally, it has been equated with life and the life force and is one of the three sacred substances that emanate from the body. The other two are semen and milk. Semen expresses male, while milk expresses female or motherly creativity. And both were considered sacred in many cults and rituals. Blood transcends the difference between the male and the female. In the deepest level of experience, one magically seizes the life force itself by shedding blood. Now, of course, we looked at earlier just how bloodthirsty the Nephilim had already been and the progeny and the empires that came out of the Middle East, we know and we've looked at how bloodthirsty and how warlike and rapacious those um, races and nations have already been. And now we're being put, the whole human race is being put up uh, in a pact to some oversouls. Could that explain some of the calamities that we've endured since John Dee's time? Well, we've had inquisitions old and new. One of the most atrocious human beings ever to be on this planet, Joseph de Mestre, in his St. Petersburg's Dialogues, has this to say. All grandeur, power, all subordination to authority rests on the executioner. He is the horror and the bond of human association. Remove this incomprehensible agent from the world. And at that very moment, order gives way to chaos. Thrones topple and society disappears. Lust for the spilling of human blood is a touchstone of the synarchist mindset. Take the 19th century Spanish counter-revolutionary ideologue Juan Donoso Cortez, who argued that human sacrifice is the most universal of all human institutions. I say, gentlemen, that dictatorship in certain circumstances, such as those in which we find ourselves, for example, is a legitimate form of government. Dictatorship, indeed, is part of the divine order. The meanest reptile, which I would trample under my feet, would seem less despicable to me than man. The point of faith, which most oppresses and weighs upon my reason, is that of the nobility and dignity of the human species. So let's not say that it's far-fetched that certain individuals walking this planet think of the human being, as Cortez is saying here, lowlier than the humble reptile. And it even causes them great distress to think of the nobility of the human creature. Such is in the minds of the progeny of the warlocks of Atlantis. Cortez goes on to say the culmination of Donoso's philosophical treatise is that the institution of bloody sacrifice is the most universal of all human dogmas and institutions. The most civilized nations and the most savage tribes believe in a pure victim offered as a perfect holocaust, he wrote. Without the death penalty, without the purifying efficacy of blood, 
all societal bonds would collapse. Since the first day of the first effusion of blood, it has never ceased to flow, and it has never been shed in vain. Mankind has always believed in three things with an unconquerable faith, that the effusion of blood is necessary, that there is a manner of shedding blood which is purifying, and another mode which is condemnatory. History clearly attests these truths. It presents to us the narrative of cruel acts, of bloody conquests, of the overflow and destruction of famous cities, of atrocious murders committed, of pure victims offered on blood-stained altars, of brothers warring against brothers, of the rich oppressing the poor, and fathers tyrannizing over their children, until the earth appears to us like an immense sea of blood, which neither the piercing breath of the winds can dry up, nor the scorching rays of the sun can absorb. Well, in Russia, 10 million soldiers are said to have died, including 10 million civilians. In Germany, 3 million soldiers and 500,000 civilians. The death toll is awesome. The total of human lives lost in the Second World War is 18,200,000 soldiers and 16,300,000 civilians for a grand total of 34 million deaths. And of course, in 1918, just after the war, the Spanish flu epidemic killed 20 million when the war killed 10. And in the Second World War, the Spanish flu killed even more men than the war did. Now, the puppet masters would much prefer a race of soulless, programmable robots to serve them, and had that in mind. However, mechanical robots give as many problems as having problematic humans around, and the latter are still useful for various occult reasons. It was therefore thought best to reduce the organic human to the level of the machine, which has been, of course, overwhelmingly successful. Man, merely a largely imperfect evolutionary step towards the intelligent computer. This is what the brain drain of the think tanks and the MITs and the SRIs of the world are absolutely itching for, contemplating. They'll even tell you themselves that they can't wait for the days when man is an organic computer and he lives in a virtual hyperspace. They're back in business. Curtis R. Schaefer, engineer for Norton Key Corporation, says, the ultimate achievement of biocontrol may be the control of man himself. The control subject would never be permitted to think as individuals. A few months after, a surgeon would equip each child with a socket mounted under the scalp and electrodes re reaching selected areas of brain tissue. The child's sensory perceptions and muscular activity would be modified or completely controlled by bioelectric signals radiating from state-controlled transmitters.